Thank you for being here. And uh, since this is an intimate group, feel free to interrupt us at any time. Uh, otherwise, we'll just keep talking, and that's it's better that you interrupt us, believe me, <laughs> from having done this with these people before. Uh, what we wanted to do is kind of apprise people of how things have evolved in terms of the threat landscape. Um, I'm involved in, this is my day job all the time. I am constantly focused on where risk is coming from. Uh, first, I spent the first uh, uh, 13 years of my existence at, at Open Invention Network uh, thinking about one company primarily and how to, uh, how to thwart their, uh, uh, their, uh, their natural tendencies toward bad behavior. That was previously. Now we're great friends. Uh, but Microsoft was the reason why Open Invention Network was developed. It was developed as a means of dealing with uh, the, at that point, the, uh, the uh, rhetoric of aggression that Microsoft was involved in. Later it became actual aggression uh, as part of their move to uh, slower stall the progress of Linux and particularly to, uh, to attempt to uh, tax and create a, uh, an uneconomic uh, 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 a challenge for Google and their, uh, their very, very successful Android operating system. And so uh, uh, we are, OAN's a very small, uh, nimble, but well-funded organization focused on living kind of the life of the uh, skirmisher. Um, much smaller than Microsoft, but we are constantly... Uh, looking at, a, at utilizing American Vents Act to do pre-issuance submissions to attack applications that they developed that looked interesting or potentially valuable to open source, and then practicing another strategy, which was while those patents are being challenged, patent applications are being challenged and potentially either going to be rejected or have diminution in scope of the claims, uh, we would be filing everything we could possibly think of that was an extension of that core application to be able to kind of create a scorched earth strategy or an Agent Orange strategy. Um, to, to, because family development is very important, obviously, in the patent world. If you can't develop a family, there aren't many singleton patents that have been compelling enough to change the world. And so we were looking at essentially not allowing them to develop families, but rather reducing the scope of whatever they had filed. And so we did this hundreds of times, literally. Um, and uh, and then we, uh, we recognized that other things were going to be necessary, but we had a portfolio. We have, still have a portfolio, but at one point we had uh, 1,500 and something patents. Uh, we spent $100 million on patents. We've acquired entities purely to get access to their inventors and their patents, uh, uh, particularly in virtualization and some other areas of security, um, looking to be able to own patents that were... Uh, uniquely compelling and valuable to be able to counterclaim against Microsoft in the event that they attacked companies and w looking to, use, to sue them. And so we did the, we, we worked behind the scenes to supply patents, to forward deploy them, as I like to call it through a euphemism. We forward deploy patents to companies to allow them to counterclaim against Microsoft and create some level of, uh, of uh, equality. Uh, because the patents that we had, the patents that we filed, read on uh, not Microsoft science fair projects, but the things that they really care about that actually they generate um, significant amounts of return from. And so uh, it was a very focused strategy that we had up until four years ago, and then they went and ruined it by becoming part of the OAN community. And so it made my job that much more difficult because, you know, it's what happens after what comes next. You have this this sense of accomplishment, and you're like, hmm, didn't see that coming. And then, you, you know, you've got to figure out other things that you've got to do. Because we actually embraced Microsoft. We had our first board meeting after they signed at Microsoft um, as a symbol of, of connection with, uh, with the company and a, a note of appreciation. Because really, I'm kidding, it's, it's been a great opportunity to be able to accomplish something like that, to be able to move from where operating company risk is not nearly as powerful and important as it once was, and the risk has shifted in a pretty dramatic way to patent assertion entities. There are still some operating companies um, that are heavy monetizers that are um, uh, active in probing the market, uh, looking to uh, provide misinformation uh, to 
people at uh, organizations like DG Comp to encourage them to launch investigations uh, against uh, policies that are IP policies that are well established, supporting things like universal reciprocity, where you give as good as you get. That's what OIN is really based on, a model where uh, where we collaborate, where we build on each other's ideas, we don't sue each other. Everywhere else, normal rules around patenting and differentiation and, and uh, innovation. If you want to innovate and you want to use patents to do so, you can do that. OIN doesn't judge. Uh, there are lots of people in the community that, that feel that software patents are not acceptable, not appropriate. I don't get involved in, in that debate or discussion because I've got a constituency that's very diverse, many of whom are the largest patent holders in their space, and some of the most successful monetizers in the world. And so we kind of went from uh, dealing with Microsoft and then a few companies around the margin to now recognizing that over the last four years we needed to do something different uh, because the, sh the threat was shifting. There are some operating companies, again, that are, that are monetizers that, that eventually will probably participate in the OAN community and recognize the interdependencies that are necessary to, that 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 sit at the, at the core of open source's uh, success. Um, but in the meantime, we're, focused a lot of, we're focusing a lot of attention and capital on, uh, uh, on what we founded with Microsoft and IBM for the ultimate irony, bringing the two of them together, uh, as well as Linux Foundation, Meta, uh, Google, a number of other companies, uh, many of the cable companies. Uh, got together to fund and found the open source zone managed by Unified Patents. Unified Patents is an entity that, um, that has been set up to uh, do IPRs and a number of other things, use crowdsourcing to collect uh, prior art, uh, and they're a uh, uh, very successful entity. Um, we have uh, engaged them over the last four years with the partners that I described to, uh, to attack poor quality uh, patents held by patent assertion entities, and they have done a very good job of doing so. Uh, they have filed against uh, close to 100, uh, uh, close to 100 uh, patents or families, um, and they've had, a, I think they're quoting like a 90% success rate. Um, and automotive-grade Linux, five or six Apache projects, uh, probably 25 projects of, uh, that the Linux Foundation manages, uh, KVM and in a number of it's a, it's a broad range of, of actions that patent assertion entities have brought against different project functionality uh, and uh, as I said they've had incredible success uh, in taking cases to term that, that rather than spend a lot of time on this um, it's harder to do these kinds of cases because we're trying to protect the whole community, not just six companies or 20 companies. That would be the, the normal focus that, of how their business model works. And so they have taken cases to term and essentially gotten pats in, patents invalidated uh, in 89% in, uh, of the cases, or 88.5% of the cases that they've, they've actually been involved in. And so this has turned out to, into been, to be a very powerful relationship in in preventing uh, damage from being, being done in terms of creating attacks or usage, usage tax on the, on the adoption of open source code. And so it's been uh, a natural evolution for me uh, to, to go from one environment to the next, and now we're looking at hardware. Uh, and so hardware is the next battlefield, I believe, and open source hardware uh, is, uh, you see open compute out there, uh, a lot of the things that, that the technologies that are coming out of that project to be able to support uh, data centers of the future are uh, very important. And then you have uh, the, uh, uh, the RISC-V project, which is, a, which is under the Linux Foundation, uh, Chips Alliance, um, AOM, which produces the AV1 free codec. Uh, these are all the projects that we are hoping to support as we look to replicate the success we've had by having almost 4,000 companies and, again, many of the most significant companies in the world join our community. We'd like to now port those companies and our model over to hardware to be able to ensure there's freedom of action and freedom to operate on the hardware side uh, because open source is not, uh, is not bounded uh, as a concept, it's the modality where the power comes from, the idea of collaborative development that, under, under, that is the, the fundamental building block on which open source is built. 
uh, established. That's really what we're, we're focused on, is freeing that model, so, because it's a social model that creates new novelty in ways that, that in the new economy we, we couldn't possibly have perceived one, 15, 20, 30, 30 years ago. Even Richard Stallman and people who were around 36 years ago, whenever uh, um, uh, his founding of, uh, of, uh, of, of Linux uh, or of open source, um, that whole, this whole period has been one of evolution, one of growth, and we want to be there to, to enable freedom of action and freedom to operate uh, and play the, uh, the role that we have been uh, tasked with playing by the, the very forward-looking founders of OIA. So that's my time. <laughs> that was uh, quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Were you saying it was long? <laughs> Don't tell me that. A little bit. Uh, I have a couple questions. For me? Yeah. That's not the way this works. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned, is it the gun locker concept, where you, where you would lend out patents? Yeah, where the, the yeah, armory. Probably. Got it. Yeah. Okay. How is that structured? Because I think, I think I've... We didn't lend them out. You didn't lend them, lend no, them out. No, because you have joinder issues if you lend them out. Right. So how was how was the how, how we would just do sale a sale of the assets to a third party entity that was being at risk or in litigation. Okay. So you you assignment. Yeah. And then no residual rights, Got other it. than that they whomever we've licensed to, the patents stay licensed to them. So they they come with the encumbrance. Got it. And then they would presumably wrap not doing certain things with the patents. Yeah. Uh, doing the pendency of But they were already a licensee, so they were already restricted Makes to sense. a great extent. But yes, we would add language, which we borrowed to some degree from IBM. Gotcha. And then what happened, because a lot of the, a lot of those, it sounded like a lot of those patents read on the, um, a certain company's yeah. technologies, and so um, what is, uh, is, is just like, ICBM is sitting in a silo somewhere collecting dust. Um, a lot of the patents we've they're already neutralized because uh, Microsoft has a license to all of them. Yeah. So as a licensee. Yeah, yeah, as a licensee. So we've redistributed some of the patents that we didn't need to member companies that paid for them. The six, eight companies, well, seven now because of the acquisition. Oh, okay. Of so Red Hat. So we're pushing them back to those companies if they need them for defensive. Activities with prescriptions on use. Got it. But probably not. They, probably, they presumably haven't been used because. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. And then it, it also sounds like in this in this pivot to open hardware, is it will it also be connected to Linux? Is it is it also t- tethered to Linux, or is it is it more? It's just open source. It's just open source. Yeah. In so fact, we we I wouldn't say we escaped, but we migrated from primarily focused on Linux at the beginning to now being focused on a much broader swath of open source technology. Got it. That would, may or may not run on Linux. Would the right analogy be the unified... Unified also has a open source zone. That we, we were, we're funding, yeah. Gotcha. And so this would be... The coverage would be just the all of open source, but, but hardware... Yeah, so we would do the same thing we've done here. We would start out with a like cross license, bring a bunch of companies in to agree that that where we collaborate, we're not going to need need to kind of build on each other. We're not going to not going to sue. So everybody cross license each other. All functionality, latent patents that where claims read on uh, functionality that's included in the in the core would be the open source hardware core. We call it the Linux system definition. Got it. In the software license. Yeah, no, it's really interesting because you're, you're, you're replacing the LSD with, uh, with something that, um, that's not the, the not the drug. That's, <laughs> that uh, can't be replaced. <laughs> Linux system definition. Yeah, you're replacing the Linux system. You've got to explain it to the audience. <laughs> See, I mean, you <laughs> a terrible moderator. Yeah. Oh, you're the moderator? Oh. <laughs> I, did. I wondered what was going on here. <laughs> hey, we're just winging it up here. Yeah. Uh, so, so I was going to talk a little bit about, for those of you who may have noticed, 
Oh, go ahead. No, 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 no. <laughs> go ahead. No, no. Uh, I have nothing left. <laughs> downstairs, there's a bunch of these books available. If you haven't gotten a signed one, oh, they're all gone. Sorry. It's available for free for download. There's a chapter in here on patents that I co-wrote that'll go through a lot of history of how the community has thought about patents over the years and the various mechanisms that they put together to address patents, including OIN. Um, it, OIN really is kind of the first organization that has sustained itself in doing things about patents. There was a lot of initiatives you know, in the early 2000s it sort of got started and fizzled out. Uh, but OIN has been steadfast in that area for a while. I also have a practice where I go out and knock patents out uh, myself from my law firm or from my clients. So where OIN or uh, Unified Patents doesn't have the ability to do that, I can do it for you as well. Um, maybe we should talk a little bit about the future. Um, just, just in the U.S., a couple of things to keep alert about. There is a pretty concerted uh, lobbying effort right now in the United States to take away some of the uh, mechanisms that can be used to challenge patents. Uh, a lot of inventors have gotten kind of up in arms and saying all the big companies are taking away the small companies' patents, that, and that needs to be changed, and we need to make it much harder for unified or other entities to challenge patents. So keep an eye on that. I'm not sure how much traction it's going to get, but uh, there is a concerted effort to change that. And I think it would be detrimental, at least to open source, if the mechanisms that can be used to get rid of some of these bad patents are uh, denatured. The other thing here in, the, in Europe to keep an eye on is the Unified Patent Court, which is on the verge of starting off and may very well change how patents are asserted in the future. You know, it has been pretty much a U.S. thing for 20 years because the perception was that the U.S. courts tended to be more favorable to patent assertions and it was a much bigger market that you could affect by one uh, lawsuit. Unified Patent Court may change that significantly now. One, one thing that may mitigate that is I think Europe is a little bit better at having clearer rules about what can and can't be patented. In the U.S., it's a complete mess and has never been resolved satisfactorily. So that may mitigate it, but it's something to keep your eye on if you're here in Europe, whether the Unified Patent Court's become the place where these patent entities go out and start going after open source and other software. And it's thought that Germany and the UK would be the most likely uh, arenas, Germany yeah. in particular. It used to be the Dutch, too, because they had uh, cross-border injunctions they used to issue. So a lot of people used to go into the Netherlands, but I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. We had a question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my question is less on uh, OIN um, and its workings. It's more about the kind of the concept conceptual dynamic between uh, the open source licenses um, and patent uh, attribution when you're looking at things like standards. Be Does that make sense, or should I go further? What, what is the question? So the question is, do uh, do the open source licenses give you a, a right to use the patent that may be or may not be included within the standard? And more generally, in fact. So, so Ian right there is going to be talking about this very issue <laughs> next. Uh -huh. So stick around. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we're just gonna, I, we're just going to use that answer for all the questions. Yes, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm Dr. Nicholas Stingley, and I'm a, a, a data ethicist. I, I mean, I'm really loving your attitude of weaponizing patents against patents. But let's be a bit provocative about it. I see one of the biggest issues with with open 
is global equity and the lack of. Do we have to think about turning beggar against patents in a new way and conceptually looking at patents which are not necessarily a problem, it's rather the benefit sharing from the super profits, which I see as a huge problem with patents. Is there any way that we could kind of weaponize patents to accept sometimes their acceptance, because they generate the super profit, because you've got the, you know, and then use that money and resource to help the real problem, which is open data access uh, and supporting global equity concerning data and data access and usage. Is that, can you conceptualize any madness like that? Uh, I have never, never thought about it. But so I would have to think about it, and it would, it would not be something I could, uh, I could address right now. But it would take some thinking. Yeah. So, so the the people who have the ability to assert patents for money uh, probably are not necessarily uh, interested in using the money that they get to open up data and stuff like that. They may have other interests in opening up data, which is a whole other question for companies like that, as we are well, saying right know. now. I think Ericsson, Nokia, and Qualcomm would be very interested in just peeling off a few a few of their uh, large gains from monetization. Okay. And just push it right back. You're lobbying, lobbying for that from Oh, yeah. 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 No, so... so uh, no, I, I think that's... The, yeah. the chance of that happening is, is zero. Yeah, the... Moni- the With the, them, anyway. And, and they're, the, they're the most significant survivors right. that are monetizers that are... that want to reserve the right to sue on core Linux and open source by not joining OAN. The, the, the companies that make a revenue business off of patents. And there's not a lot of them. Most most companies use them as trading chips. Yeah. Between, Even Microsoft other, changed yeah. their policy. Google changed yeah. their policy. But but there are a few of them, and they yeah. consider it to be a revenue-generating center in their business and are probably not too disposed to use it for, for other good purposes. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's posi- there's some world that you can envision companies getting together that are you know, like IBM being involved with a number of other companies that are like-minded that may, because IBM has just changed their approach. You know, this whole, one of the things that the elephant in the room when you discuss patents and innovation is that they're equated. Um, you know, one, it's considered by all the, there are different bodies that will evaluate the, uh, the innovative capacities of a country how innovative is a country, how innovative is a company, and they basically reduce it to the very simplistic analysis of if you have patents, patents equate to, uh, to innovation. That is a myth uh, that should be exploded once and for all because the quality issue uh, is really what's involved in innovation and, and the timing of what, what... You have many innovations that... that many innovations captured in the claims of the patent that are not valuable because the, the technology takes 15, 20, 30, 40 years to, to, be, to mature. Display technology is a classic example. Do you have a... We should let Michael finish no, up. No, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, oh. That came out, sorry. Did, uh, I, I thought I was just thinking. Do, do you have any particular projects that you'd like to discuss that you've worked yeah. on that is relevant to this? <laughs> yeah, you have this. Your... I think you do. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I recently took uh, GPT-4, and I created a, uh, I asked it to create a, a, a claim chart, an anti-claim chart, uh, and, and I found that it did it quite well. And I, I, I created, basically, it's, it's a, you, you basically put in a patent number, and then you put in an infringing, a description of an infringing technology, and within a couple of seconds, it can create a, it'll go through claim by claim, and it can create a passable claim chart, right? And now what was interesting about it when I showed it to my friends at some of the companies that have been mentioned here is that they, uh, the first result that came up was not that great, but Within it, just like when you Google things, right? The, within it was a guidepost to how to refine that result. And then the second result that came up was, was the equivalent of something that you'd get from a second tier or third tier provider of, of, of claim charts, something that you pay $1,000 to $1,500 for, right? And so the implications of that are, are profound, right? I mean, I mean, for a lot of these patent departments, 
that I showed it to, their, their first uh, their first sort of inclination was to rethink how how they were processing these. Right. First of all, so to to no longer pay for these kind of sort of because um, you know a lot of this a lot of these a lot of these games are economic in nature. Right. It's 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 a question of you know, a lot of the trolls can show up because they can, they're fine with sending out a ton of patents that were, you know, a ton of claim charts that made no sense, right? If, if you, somebody shows at your door with, uh, you know, 1,500 low-quality claim charts and you, you, you go through one or two of them and they make no sense, they'll still they'll, they'll, they'll say, oh, we've got 498 claim charts that make sense and you, you just don't have the energy, time or energy to burn on that. But if you could then... You know, within a couple hours, flip flip back to them, fifteen hundred counterclaim charts, fifteen hundred sort of charts that 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 uh, advocate non infringement, or that you know uh, you know what are they going to do with that, right? I, I think I think it, it dramatically upsets. I, I don't know I don't know what the long term implications are, but at least uh, at the negotiating at the negotiating table, as the it has the. You know, as these tools, this was not very easy to build. By the way, this 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 is like. A, and is it available open? Or are you selling this? Uh, it is. A, I, I'm building it with somebody. The person that I'm building it with, okay. who might be watching, <laughs> <laughs> does want to sell it. I kind of just want to give it away. Right. But I'm also worried about assertions, right? Because it could be used either way. Yes. Right. So I'm trying to build the counter. I'm trying to figure out a way to build it where it only can provide defensive utility. And I think that's for good, but not evil. Correct. Okay. Right. Um, but uh, but uh, you know, it's it's anybody anybody can can, can build something like. That. So so that's that's a uh, it's 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 interesting. Uh, you know, these this is one of many, I think, industries that will will radically change, especially the ones that are highly com- you know depend on highly commoditized services like this. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to watch. Yep. Okay, so we're Clever. pretty close to Thanks. time. Anybody else got I'm questions? Time maybe just for any final thoughts from uh, Keep your eyes peeled on this stuff. It, it's it's kind of interesting if you look at the history of this stuff. And I've been I've been a patent lawyer for thirty five years and have been working in open source for twenty. There there was always this looming threat of a giant patent debacle that was going to crush open source. It never really happened. Uh, it, it was sort of low-key uh, concern along the time. Um, whether that will ever happen or not is remains to be seen, but I guess remaining vigilant is important because you, don't, you want to make sure that you're ready when something bad occurs. I think it's a particularly good question, though. Uh, to think about, particularly, and from your background, it, when I think about hardware, we've looked at all the patents that are potentially damaging for Risk V, and in the beginning, Risk V will have an impact on uh, on mobile devices and the people that supply mobile devices in the embedded world. But as the data centers uh, and other high value chips that Intel, AMD, and others are producing. That is where there's real stress, uh, potentially five, seven, ten years from now. Uh, and so I think how companies that have been incumbents and, and founded the industry respond and react. Um, Intel's obviously formed a separate business, a foundry business, to be as a hedge. But still, is a question of whether that can really co- compensate for loss of business on the in the core side, since they already are out of the you know, for all intents and purposes, out of the the mobile space. Um, So they've missed a big opportunity there, and so they they have other areas, but those areas don't have as much growth, and they have more. When they are going to be threatened, it'll be by RISC-V, potentially. RISC-V was an idea that was founded by Dave Patterson at Berkeley in 1989, Something like that. Yeah, the risk the risk architecture has been around forever. So yeah. you know, actually mapping a current patent on something like that is it's a difficult task. But you know, the concept of, yeah. of essentially hardware, software, co-design, and simulation 
Um, there are lots of moving parts that are, tar- that are targetable surfaces that you can go after. Anyway, I think that space is potentially going to be that, that battleground that, uh, that uh, McCoy is kind of referencing never really manifested itself. I like to think that OIN's existence helped in, existence helped in, in uh, mitigating the risks that, that were represented. But, but I think it's, it, it, we've gotten through without the, the battle. And collectively, there's lots of things beyond OIN that collectively we've we fought that war well. Now we have to see what happens in hardware because there's a lot at stake. Uh, and so that's my comment. I look forward to the release of your open hardware patent pool, licensing pool. Yeah. So thank okay, you very much. Sorry to go long. <laughs>